Anyways, wanted to say thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here in Georgia. And what Georgi said with his talk, I think, was absolutely perfect, uh, where he first resonated with the kind of the ethics and the motivations for why we're here. Uh, and it is much more than money, because I think that what we're doing is a transformative revolution that will have really big impact over the coming decades. So uh, who I am, I, I'm Rob Viglione. I, I'm one of the co-founders for Zen Cash. Uh, and currently, I'm the team lead, so I, I'm, uh, I'm the guy that you can blame for anything that you don't like that we're doing. Um, but, you know, definitely praise our team. We have some really cool guys here as well. If you like anything that you hear or you're interested in the project, we have a booth outside, so please join us. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is um, what I've experienced over the last 10 years in this industry of where we've come and I think where we are now, and probably more importantly, where we're going to be heading. Um, so the big thing that I see is that this is a massive, massively competitive industry where now the barriers to entry for anyone in the world have completely collapsed. And now you see probably the most competitive market in the world. And there's hundreds of billions of dollars at stake, potentially trillions of dollars at stake. And we need to figure out the best way to kind of steer the industry to really take advantage of the opportunities that we have. Okay. So... Uh, one, one of the big points of, of what I'm, I'm going to be mentioning, and sorry if I keep looking back at the screen here, but uh, we're, we're competing in a very different uh, environment than tech companies 10 years ago or beyond uh, because we're competing in an open source world. And what open source means is that we're basically creating technology and then giving it to society by posting it on, online, and anyone can grab our code and they can copy it, paste it, and launch their own project that basically mimics everything we're doing. So as an entrepreneur, you have to think about how do you compete in this type of world where no longer can you take advantage of what we call in business like a, a technology moat uh, around your business to kind of differentiate you from your competition when your competition can just literally copy what you're doing. So what I've experienced over the last year running this project um, you know, it is we can think about other types of moats, other things that we can do to differentiate ourselves to be competitive. So if you're an investor, this might be some set of lessons learned that you can apply to your future investments. If you're an entrepreneur, maybe you can take some, some pointers from what, what we've learned to maybe make your business uh, more effective. So uh, the, the big thing here is that uh, what Bitcoin and Satoshi did was essentially open Pandora's box, uh, and there's no going back. So essentially, we have uh, you know, an analogy where we have a sort of Cambrian explosion of innovation and entrepreneurship uh, that, that ripples across the world. And there's no such thing as a national border that matters anymore. And this is a really, really good thing for society uh, as a whole. If you're a businessman, you like, you like borders. So if you're a businessman, you want to have a monopoly. right? That's the best thing you can have as a businessman. But as a society, that's a horrible thing. What you want is as much open competition so that anyone in the world can participate, and that's what we have here. So there's some, some very interesting characteristics of, of what I see that, that we have ongoing. Um, there's an interesting term that Nassim Taleb coined with a book called Anti-Fragile, th this term, anti-fragility. So essentially, it means that your system actually grows stronger through adversity. So this is kind of a core premise of, of an evolutionary principle where um, you know, the more, the more uh, shocks you have to your system, the more negative things that happen, if you can internalize these shocks productively and learn from them, you can actually make your organization significantly stronger. So I hypothesize that the blockchain industry has some interesting characteristics with respect to anti-fragility because it's a massively competitive marketplace. And if you want to be competitive, you have to look to build an anti-fragile organization. So this is the path that I think we're heading on with, uh, with Zencash. Um, so really, th this is entrepreneurship on steroids, guys. So this is probably the most competitive environment you could imagine. Um, so you know, the competition, basically, because there's no cost or very low cost to entry, now you, you can't uh, insulate yourself by essentially being a, a large corporation and saying, well, I can invest $100 million, therefore no one can compete. Well, now you can invest a bunch of money, but then some other you know, kid in another country may, may just have a better idea, maybe some permutation of your idea that works better, and he can now go and compete with you. So it's a very different world that we're living in now. And as an entrepreneur or an investor, you have to adapt to it and try to take advantage to make sure that you're, you're on a good path for yourself. So there's no industry that's sacred. 
I got into this into the Bitcoin industry because I love the idea of separating money from state and looking at money now as an application that we can now compete. So this is what Bitcoin did, and Bitcoin's core you know, application is essentially uh, an alternative money. It's a money that takes on certain defined kind of engineering characteristics. But what we can do now is we can map this to what central banks do for money. And I love this. To me, it was a really nice thing to think about we're Uberizing money in a way that's responsive to the market. And people can essentially cast their preferences by buying into the system or freely leaving the system. So the whole point, though, is that no industry is sacred. You can think about the most, the most sacred industry in your country, and I guarantee you there's going to be some blockchain startup that's trying to compete with it. Um, so it, as an entrepreneur, you, you have to think about how you differentiate yourself and what makes your product and business unique in a way that uh, will make it successful over time. Because we're giving away technology, at you know, our core technology, we no longer have this competitive moat to kind of fall back on. We can't go file an intellectual property, like file a patent, and expect some lawyers or the government to protect your industry from competition. Now this is all freely open for competition, so we have to think about other ways to differentiate ourselves. And some ways that we, we've learned at Zencash is we've basically built a full stack business, which means that we have uh, every discipline that you could imagine for a large organization, like business development, marketing, operations to run efficiently, finance, accounting, uh, product and user experience experts, customer support, all of these things. And now we try to differentiate ourselves and create modes around our business based on every single business line that we have. Uh, and when it comes to technology now, our solution potentially is to create a hybrid intellectual property uh, framework where we have our core technology fully open source, but maybe some of the products that we build on top of that, that infrastructure are, are private. Maybe there's an entrepreneur that wants to build a private application or a private business on top of our infrastructure. And this would give us some competitive advantage because you can copy and paste our code, but you can't copy and paste an ecosystem. So I think this is what you need to look for in projects, and this is what you need to look for as, as uh, an entrepreneur. So combinatorial innovation, this was kind of the, the topic title, is, is essentially the, the idea that um, inventions are amazing. So you can invent something and make society better. But what happens more often than not in the innovation domain is you take existing ideas and you combine them in different unique ways. Or maybe you try an idea differently than other people have. And you can create massive, massive value, value adds for society. So as a business, you can explode by just taking technology that's already existing and just trying it in different ways. So most of the, the big technology companies out there are not necessarily dominant because they're just constantly spinning out new inventions. But what they're doing is they're taking existing in technology and just applying it in different ways that's innovative in itself. So innovation really has these two components. And I urge all of us to think about this is sometimes we can stand on the shoulders of giants and, and taking like Satoshi's innovation with Bitcoin and improving on it and then applying it in different ways that no one else is doing in the marketplace. So we think we're doing this right now. And the way that we do it is we consider the full ecosystem. One problem that we had in this industry early on, which I, I still think that we have, is that a lot of the products that we're building are essentially products that engineers build for other engineers, which doesn't really scale very well. So if you want to have 100 million users using an application, it, it probably should be you know, built for those 100 million users and not built by you know, just those 12 developers who, who worked on it. So this is what we're, we're doing right now, is we're kind of pivoting into the product domain and, thinking, and bringing in other experts. Even um, think about skill sets like bringing in artists and graphic designers, um, product experts, product managers, um, people that understand marketing for products. And these are skill sets that necessarily, or weren't necessarily um, you know, part of this industry early on. Because the technology, the infrastructure was so new and everyone was so excited about that. But I think if we're going to scale massively and start making an impact in the world, we have to start thinking about the end user and start thinking about the products that will make their lives tangibly better. So the, the full ecosystem that we consider really includes everyone. This is kind of the traditional part of the ecosystem for Bitcoin. But then we go beyond. And the important thing, the takeaway is 
Um, you know, economics is really important. You can have amazing technology, but if your economics isn't good, you could not scale. Uh, you, you could fail just because of that. So what we do is we make sure that every stakeholder in our system has an economic motivation to be part of the ecosystem. So you benefit by being part of the ecosystem. What Bitcoin, uh, you know, Bitcoin was able to grow in the early days because there were so many people enthusiastic for the technology and for the kind of the ethos behind it. But that's not how you scale into 100 million users or a billion users. You have to make sure that each of these users has some positive motivation to participating in your ecosystem. So as you're developing your own, your own ecosystems, you need to think about the different stakeholders and make sure you layer in incentive compatible mechanisms to make it worth their while. Okay, so here's just a snapshot of our, our architecture. So if you're familiar with Zen or not, I mean, we started off with our first application being Zen Cash which is essentially a, pri a privacy-oriented cryptocurrency that uses zero-knowledge cryptography, which is a special class of cryptography that I find extremely fascinating, but has a whole bunch of other applications. And really where we're focusing on are these other applications, like in uh, messaging services, messaging protocols, distributed file storage, and then a whole suite of businesses that now we can build on top of this architecture that take advantage of this cryptography. So essentially the big benefit of this cryptography is it applies a sort of functional form onto a data, which makes the, the data accessible uh, via the blockchain in a useful way, but without revealing the data itself. So you could think of a whole suite of applications, say in healthcare, where health records are very sensitive, but you may not want to reveal all of someone's private data, but you, could still, you still want to use that data in, in interesting ways. So we're building out a whole system to make this possible. Started off with a cryptocurrency. Privacy is really important. We make sure that we care about all of the stakeholders, like the, the people running the software all over the world. We're doing really interesting stuff for the people that are very inter are into this type of technology. We're doing stuff in the DAG, the directed ASIC graph type of the technology. We're doing side chains. We're doing smart contracting, ultimately, uh, with uh, zero knowledge cryptography. So we're doing a bunch of really cool stuff. But I think one of the most fascinating things that we're doing to be really resilient and anti-fragile is we're building a, a democratic voting system into our software so that the users can determine what we do as a project. The users can directly vote on where resources go, what projects we fund. So to me, this is a very fascinating revolution and at the very core of what we consider a corporation. Like, how does a corporation operate? What do you do? How do you manage a corporation? What we're trying to do is democratize corporations and make them open and accessible to anyone in the world who wants to participate. So I think that's one of the most fascinating things that we're doing uh, within our architecture. I'm really happy to talk about that. We're using some you know, fancy game theory and economics and cryptography to make it, uh, I think, probably the most interesting voting system in the world. Um, so the, this is probably the key takeaway for the entrepreneurs out there, is you will experience so many shocks because there's so much uncertainty in this industry. We don't know where regulations are going. We don't know what politicians will do with laws about, about cryptocurrencies. So we know that for sure there will be many shocks. And if you just look at the price movements of the markets, they're insane. You know, you see 10 times growth and then you see 90% collapses all happening within three months. This is truly insane. Now, as an entrepreneur, you need to think about how you're going to operate in this environment. So for me, it, it's a challenge when I go and I hire, uh, you know, a dozen new people on our team and all of a sudden the market crashes 50% the next day. What do you do as an entrepreneur, right? So these are the types of things you need to consider. But the takeaway is, you know, if you can build your organization in such a way where these shocks can be positively internalized and you can learn from them and grow, you will be the dominant competitor going forward. And other organizations that just aren't as resilient and aren't building themselves in this kind of resilient, anti-fragile way will not be able to compete with you. So we've gone through some very specific shocks uh, that I'm happy to talk about. It, I think it'll make a great movie one day, a great book that we'll write. Um, it's kind of insane. It culminated with one of the guys early on who was an insider who attacked us, stole a, you know, a, a military vehicle a couple of weeks ago and went rolling down a U.S. city. So it's been truly insane, like the stuff that you would make a movie out of. But we've grown significantly stronger because of all this insanity. And I think this makes us probably one of the most professional teams in the, in the industry. And we're going to survive. Right. 
Um, so the road to, to anti-fragility, to me, th this uh, it really focuses on the ability to be censorship resistant and decentralize your organization and empower other individuals so that you, you don't have kind of failure points with, say, like me leading a team or, or any of our other directors or leaders. You don't want the system to fail because something happens to one of the leadership. You want to decentralize as much as possible. And a core part of decentralization to us is to create a democratic or organization in which any stakeholder can participate participate directly. Um, then there's some other really important things that you have to do. You have to think about funding models, right? How are you going to fund your organization? We also have a very interesting solution to this, right? There's a lot of ICOs out there that raise a lot of money up front, which could be a good thing, but can also be a bad thing. Because as a manager, do I want $100 million today and then try to figure out how am I going to manage this $100 million for the next 20 years? I would have no idea, guys. I would be guessing what to invest in today versus what to invest in five years from now. So I think economically a much more efficient funding model are the incremental funding models, which actually mimic the, the pre-Bitcoin re, you know, realities, where if you were an entrepreneur and you had an interesting idea, you would build a prototype, get some early customers, fund it a little bit yourself, and then approach someone for seed capital and say, look at what I've done. It's, it's very interesting. I have a little bit of a market. Can I have $200,000 to build it out further? Then you would build it out further and then go to a venture capital fund and kind of repeat the process again at every, every stage of your growth. What we're doing now in this industry, because we've democratized the funding process with this crowdfunding, with ICOs, is we're kind of skipping a lot of these steps. There's some good in the sense that now entrepreneurs all over the world have the opportunity to raise money, but I think that a lot of the money that they're raising is a little bit inefficient. So I, I urge people to look at the incremental funding models. That's what we do. So essentially every two and a half minutes, every block that's mined of Zen, uh, we get a little bit of, of money into our community pool of, of resources that in four months or six months, we hope that our users will be able to directly vote on how to use these resources. So I think that this is kind of a key to sustainability that other projects should consider as well. Um, so, you know, the, the other bottom line is we're going to have so many exogenous shocks that we experience as entrepreneurs and as an industry as a whole. So learn to internalize them productively and you will be so much more competitive in the long run. So that's what I have, guys. I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards. I'll be right outside at our booth. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions from, please. Oh. Hi, so you have mentioned the 51% attacks and given the recent development of Equihash A6 uh, by Bitmain and Inner Silicon, which effectively render all the GPUs, uh, let's say, useless for mining. Uh, are you considering uh, algo change, like for example, Bitcoin Z has done, uh, or for Zhash or like uh, Bitcoin Gold is going? Is it something you're considering? Sure, we are. Absolutely. So there, there's a kind of a handful of solutions to being ASIC resistant. One, the simple one is change the parameters of Echo Hash right now. Uh, so that's the first thing that we're looking at. The second is potentially having a new mining algorithm. And the third, which is much more sustainable in my opinion, is getting outside of the ASIC race, this cat and mouse uh, game with ASIC manufacturers, and our block DAG technology that we're developing, hopefully we'll be implementing in the fourth quarter of this year or first quarter of next year, completely revolutionizes the whole mining concept. So it's a proof of work optimized DAG structure that arranges blocks essentially in a tree, in a tree rather than kind of a sequential chain. But what it does then is we can collapse difficulty significantly. So we hope to get to the point where GPU solo mining will be profitable again, in which case ASICs are irrelevant. Thank you. Yep. One more question. question. Okay, thank oh, you very much. Yeah.